This is the part two video podcast for chapter 17. In the part one video podcast, I chat, said chapter 16, and then I realized it's really chapter 17, so I fixed the PowerPoint presentation to reflect that. And here I want to talk about aquifers, some basic definitions and concepts, and then finally, I want to explain to you how pressure transducers work and show you how we use them in groundwater wells for automated monitoring. An aquifer is basically just a sedimentary layer below ground that has enough water in it that we can pump water out of it. There comes in two varieties. There's confined aquifers and unconfined aquifers. The unconfined aquifer is where you have atmospheric pressure above it and therefore the water level in the well will be reflective of the water table position. However, in the confined aquifer, the water level in the well will not be, and that's why when we talk about hydraulic head, it has a component of both pressure and elevation above the, above the datum that um, may or may not have anything to do with the water table. Just for reference, the largest known aquifer in the world is the Ogallala Aquifer in the Midwestern United States. It uh, has been cut off from its natural sources and it's being pumped really, really fast. So this is an example where hydrology plays a very important role in being able to characterize um, our use of water and problems that arise from that. And in fact, um, recently studies have shown that it only has about 50 years until it runs dry completely. And in some regions, it's already below the minimum death in order to um, facilitate large scale irrigation. So it's just an illustration of how important uh, monitoring of groundwater is with the methods that we've been talking about. Here's an example of a water table elevation map from Davis, California in our region. So Davis, I know it's kind of hard to see, but it's right in the middle of this map. We've got the mountains to the west. Okay, there's Lake Berryessa over here. And on the other side, the star is Sacramento. And we've got the Sacramento River here. And you can see that there are contour lines in here. It's very hard to read what the levels are, but what you can see is that the contours are going pretty much across the valley, which indicates that the water is coming out of the mountains where it's sourcing from and going down towards Davis and eventually all the way over to the Sacramento River. So not only does water flow on the surface in relation to topography, but it's also flowing in the subsurface in relation to topography as well. If we were to put wells all over the place in a region, then you could screen just a very narrow interval of the well and therefore feel only the hydraulic head associated with that screened interval. And when you do that and you look at the head, then you can see the gradient of pressure in the vertical. And what you'll find is that um, pressure does change in the vertical and as a result of that, we have flow that's both um, lateral and vertical. And what you can see here are black lines that are showing the locations of equal hydraulic head, which would be along one of these contour lines. And then the flow is perpendicular because flow occurs from areas of high hydraulic head to areas of low hydraulic head. If we also look at a, at a, at a longitudinal section down from the mountains to the lowlands, we often find that there are um, stratigraphic or geological layers to the subsurface, some of which are more water bearing than others. So we may have rain falling in the mountains and that will promote water to infiltrate and recharge in, into the, the unconfined aquifer in the mountains. But then as that layer dips down, um, it may very well become confined and no longer an unconfined aquifer, but in, in the lowlands it could be a confined aquifer. And these confined aquifers are the places where we're putting w water wells for clean drinking water and irrigation water. And so that, that means that water is discharging out of those wells. And you can see here what's called a well of, I'm sorry, a cone of depression around each of these wells, which is where the um, water level is being drawn down. Now, this image is a little bit um, 
inappropriate in that for an, a confined aquifer, you're not literally dewatering, but you're just reducing the pressure because the pressure is usually not uh, so low that the water level would literally drain the aquifer completely because the water is under compression, so it can, um, it can um, spread as the pressure decreases. It just means that the head will be, you know, not as high as the water surface. It'll be, uh, it'll have a cone of depression around it. Now, if you have a unconfined aquifer, then that's different. For an unconfined aquifer, you are literally dewatering and lowering the water table. And this shows some uh, unconfined wells, and uh, I think that's what that's showing anyway. And, um, and you can see the cone of depressions where in this case, like each individual landowner um, has their own well. They may have a septic system that's producing contamination that's, of course, getting out of the septic tank and um, maybe going down into the groundwater table as well. So the primary method for monitoring water levels in a well, especially in areas where there's pumping, are pressure transducers. And I've already had you playing with pressure transducers in labs and you know we did a calibration with a pressure transducer and in fact some of you may have even used this exact model that's shown here. Pressure transducer is used to measure depth because there's a relationship between depth and pressure. Um, and so we can put that into a well. We don't have to worry about the velocity head, as I've said before, because it's just moving too slowly. And um, therefore, we can have the relationship between pressure and water depth, accounting for temperature and salinity if needed. The time interval, how often you're going to want to make this measurement, is usually just going to be daily if all you care about you know, is just uh, how something is changing naturally. However, if pumping is present, then you may need to have substantially more frequent sampling. And there's something called logarithmic time sampling, which allows you to collect very frequent samples as soon as pumping begins and then decrease that over time as uh, the system equilibrates to that drawdown. Also, I think I said this to you in the lab, you can see that the shape, like the, the diameter and shape of the data logger at the top end of this system is designed so that it can rest on the well. So here you can see this scientist is inserting the pressure transducer into the well and then the data logger will basically become a cap um, at the top of that. When you put the pressure transducer in, you're pretty much just going to leave that there for you know, uh, you know, a year or more. Um, you may have to replace the batteries from time to time. And it's important to note, just as I talked about in the part one video podcast, that you need to keep track of how long the cable is that you've put down. You need to put it down deep enough into the water so that you can um, you know, make sure it's always underwater and recording a depth. And um, you have to measure the, basically the kind of hydraulic head measurements like before. So what is the ground surface elevation? What is the height of the, of the lip of the well relative to the ground? And then subtract from those two numbers the distance to the tip of the pressure transducer. And then add back the depth of water so that gets you to the water surface elevation. Um, that's something that many software programs that come with these pressure transducers are already designed to put in. So you can put in the appropriate numbers and it will report your data straight out as a, uh, as a water surface elevation instead of as a raw pressure reading or depth reading. So how do pressure transducers actually work? This is something that I haven't talked to you about yet, um, so I definitely want to cover it. To understand a pressure transducer, we first have to understand a strain gauge because this is the fundamental sensing technology that's in use. <clears throat> strain is the force tending to pull or stretch something apart. If I, take, if I take a flat plate and I bend it up or down, that will create tension because um, that will tend to stretch something out. So a strain gauge consists of a metallic foil pattern supported on a flexible insulation. The black line here represents that metallic foil pattern. And by having it um, be not just a single line, 
but have a greater length, it increases the sensitivity of how this operates. Well, it turns out that if you deform that object, then it will change the electrical resistance of this metallic foil. And that electrical resistance is something that you can measure with a voltage. <coughs> so electrical resistance is the key aspect of a strain gauge. Now how we take a strain gauge and turn it into a depth sensor is we put a strain gauge on something called a diaphragm, which is a bendable material that will respond to a difference in pressure. Imagine that you have this, you know, this support, okay, on either sides, usually going to be round or something, and you'll have the diaphragm in there. Now imagine that on one side you, you have atmospheric pressure, and then on the other side you have atmospheric plus water pressure. Um, that extra weight of water pressure is going to cause the diaphragm to deflect that is going to torque the strain gauge basically, well not torque, I shouldn't say torque, but I mean it's going to, it's going to flex that and that's going to change the electrical conductivity. So this is the key, is like a pressure transducer consists of a diaphragm that gets deformed um, depending on the difference in pressure internal to the sensor and external to it. If you put a vent all the way through the pressure transducer to equilibrate with atmospheric pressure, then you're only sensing the hydrostatic pressure. If it's sealed, then you might have you know, any arbitrary reference pressure inside or some sort of vacuum pressure or something like that, in which case you have to be mindful that you're measuring both the atmospheric pressure and the water pressure. Okay, I think that covers that one. So with a pressure transducer, you can put it into a well. For a shallow well in the unconfined aquifer, um, we can see here that the water levels, this is day since January 1st, 1992. You know, it's, it's not changing very much. It's fluctuating a few feet here over, over the seasons. But now if you look at this deep well, um, then you can see that this well where, is where pumping is having an effect. It's probably in, in an aquifer or something like that. And when you pump, the water level drops down very quickly. Um, and you can see how there's dramatic differences in the frequency of sampling um, as this is going on. So here's, here's where there's a, uh, a pumping test that's being done, drawing that down. Then the pumping test stops. The water level recovers very, very quickly. Um, seasonal use of water, perhaps, followed by another pumping test, and so on. So you can see the importance of a pressure transducer if you want to chase down the water levels very rapidly you know, over a matter of seconds to minutes. This is a map that shows water table decline from spring 1986 to fall 1990. Um, and you can see again here the Sacramento area and Davis. And you can see that there's a substantial amount of water table decline, like 34 feet, 12 feet, 44 feet. So pretty large declines through the summer as a result of groundwater pumping. And this is why it's important to have a pressure transducer network of wells. Over on the right, just for reference, I put this classic photo from the San Joaquin Valley showing how as a result of water table declines, um, it's caused the ground to actually subside because you don't have water pressure to offset the weight of the soil above it. And so, that soil then collapses, and you can see here from 1925 to 1977 just how much that has declined. And this is a big problem we have in droughts today is that groundwater pumping uh, is used to replace the water that isn't obtained from surface water from snowmelt in the mountains, and um, we just can't sustain the levels of pumping that are being done. And in fact, in California, from 2003 to 2009, which you know was a dry period, but not, not a ridiculously dry period, such as the period since then, um, you can see that there's been a significant decrease uh, or overdraft in terms of feet per year. Now, this is like a GIS map, and you know I always hate to see decimal places like this. This is somebody letting ArcGIS uh, dictate the science for them, which is too bad, but 
you know, still, if you, if you round this to proper numbers, assuming that it isn't actually sensitive to eight or nine decimal places, um, you can see that the areas here that are like a little bit of green and um, these concentric rings of yellow to orange are the highest declines over this you know, six year period, whereas to the north, the pink and the whites are smaller declines. 75% of the groundwater loss has been occurring in the San Joaquin River Basin. So um, this is not observed from wells though. This is uh, observations that comes from satellite measurements, which is some newer technologies. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about um, aquifers and the main field methods that you need to have there are pressure transducers mounted into wells in order to be able to monitor the water levels or what we can call the hydraulic head as it's going up and down.